Hello, everyone out there. Hey, everybody. So glad you could join us because I'm here with some wonderful friends of mine to share some information and give lots of things, lots of information for the holidays because I know lots of things are coming up and you just don't want to end up where we work. So these are all my friends here that are emergency medicine physicians. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And uh, I think it's Dr. Leslie. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I am so glad that you were able to join us today. I am Dr. Leslie, as you know, board certified emergency physician, but I'm also a best-selling author and international speaker and a professional photographer. And I am, I help educate you about emergency conditions to keep you safe, healthy, and out of the emergency department. Yay, yes. Gotta keep them out that emergency department. Okay, okay. Dr. Lindy. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Good evening to my, my uh, uh, emergency physician. Uh, amazing, amazing sisters. We are a special class of physicians. And as African-American uh, board certified ER docs, um, I am honored to be in your company tonight, ladies. Uh, my name is Dr. Lindy Hayes, and I'm your board certified emergency medicine physician, also known as the physician fashionista and creator of Lux Docs Lab Coats and Medical Apparel. I help uh, busy and overwhelmed physicians go from frumpy to fashionable, all while maintaining their authentic sense of style and gaining the respect that we deserve. And don't we deserve some respect nowadays, ladies? Oh, yeah. from yes. us. Yes. Oh, yes. Amen. That's all. Yes. That's all. Mm -hmm. like, bye, look, bow yeah. down, bow down. <laughs> okay. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight, ladies. All right, now we have Dr. Teresa. All right. All right. Well, I'm also, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Yvette, for arranging this with our, our my fellow frontline yes. uh, COVID pandemic doctors. I am Dr. Jerisa Berry, uh, of course, board certified emergency medicine physician, a best-selling author, international speaker. On a regular basis, I help women who have been struggling to become moms through securefertility.com, but also because of my various journeys and trials. I also help women and that are struggling with hair loss and also those that are struggling to maintain some sort of normalcy even though they're dealing with difficult diagnoses like cancer. And I do that through my books, my social media lives, and my speaking engagement. So I am honored to be here tonight as we get ready to talk about some of these holiday emergencies y'all that we're seeing. Great, great. Oh man, that's exciting. Very multi-purpose. Okay, so I started off this, and I didn't tell you who I am. So I, I am Yvette McQueen, MD, emergency physician and travel doctor, a global physician on a mission to educate about health, travel wellness, and disease prevention. So I help people to travel well, if they're still traveling right now. <laughs> but also, I am a wellness lifestyle coach. So I help people to maintain and manage chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes. And if you follow me, you followed me last month every day. And this, this month, I'm doing my wellness challenge every day. So keep following me on that. So but I wanted all of us to talk about accidents and emergencies that happen during the holiday time. Now, I'm going to say this, so this is the disclaimer. You know, if, if you need true medical advice, this is for your knowledge. This is information we're given. Medical advice, please seek your physician. Or, or if you feel like if you have a medical emergency, please go to the emergency department as soon as possible. So we're going to start off with Dr. Leslie. And she wants to tell us about how to stay safe with fire safety during the holidays. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Yvette. So fire safety is a huge thing during the holidays. I think just on the news, we hear about fires more often for some reason during this time of year. One out of actually approximately 130 uh, fires are started each year from Christmas trees alone. 
And then on top of that, 760 are fully engulfed homes. And you know, during the holidays, for you to lose your home due to a fire that could have been prevented, I mean, it's just tragic. We all know that. So one of the things we have to think about with fire safety is candles. I love holiday decorations. I am not finished yet. I will be soon, hopefully. <laughs> but just having the house decorated, having the scents and everything else going on, you get those uh, holly berry scented candles and things like that. A lot of times people don't think about candles. We use them around our house all throughout the year, but in around the holiday time, we tend to put them in places we don't normally. So some people are tempted to put them in their windowsills. The windowsill is not the place for candles. Electric candles, fine, absolutely fine. But actual candles near the window, most people's window ledges aren't deep enough. And the possibility of knocking that candle over and starting a fire, or your curtains or blinds being too close, starting a fire, entirely too dangerous. Another thing people do with candles, now I haven't seen this recently. I know in years gone by, people used to put candles on their trees. Have any of you all put candles on your trees before? No? Okay. <laughs> I, I said, I've never seen it, but never put a candle on a tree. I don't care if it's an artificial tree or a live tree. Definite no-no. So I'm one of those people that loves a real tree. I have to have that scent. Fortunately, I don't have allergies that prevent me from having a real tree. But if you do have a real tree, number one, keep it watered. A dry tree can go up in flames so incredibly fast. Um, literally, if you look on the news, you will see a lot of uh, fire departments and things like that give demonstrations as far as how fast a tree can go up a tree can go up literally in three seconds. So we know to preserve that tree, you wanna keep that tree well watered. The reason is not just to preserve the tree, but for that tree to get dry, that's an automatic fire hazard. You might as well just put the tree in your fireplace. Okay, I don't recommend that. Pine leaves a lot of smoke, but the meaning is there. So a couple other things about your tree. So you see my tree there in the background, I've got lights on it. If your tree is dry and you are not using the proper lights, once again, a huge fire hazard. So with your lights, you want to use UL listed lights. So anytime you buy lights, it should have that little tag on it that says UL listed. That is gonna tell you that it's gonna be a safe light for your tree. And you can't swap out outdoor lights and indoor lights, okay? So those UL listed lights are safe, but even out of those UL listed, LED lights are the way to go. They do cost a little bit more, but the LED lights don't get hot. So you really decrease that risk tremendously of having a household fire because you've now lit up um, something that's gonna cause heat towards your tree. Now, for those people who go with the artificial trees, which let's face it, they do make life a lot easier. <laughs> those artificial trees, you wanna make sure that that artificial tree says on it, fire resistant, okay? We like to save money. We like to go for the cheapest stuff sometimes. It's not worth it. Your house is worth a lot more than that Christmas tree. So you wanna go with fire resistant trees. All right, so that's my tree story. Now, because I don't think you can see, I guess if I move over again, you see I have a fireplace back there. So what another thing that I love to do is put a log on the fire. When it gets nice and cold, you wanna bundle all up, you wanna get in your robe or your, yeah, for some, some people who like to use those uh, pajamas that are full body pajamas, you know, with the little footies and things like that. <laughs> the onesies for adults. Um, <laughs> but when you get, when you start your fire in your fireplace, number one, before you even do anything, make sure your flue is open. If you don't know what the flue is, that is a little piece of metal that covers, it's up inside your fireplace. 
and that blocks off the passageway from your fireplace up through your chimney. That must be open if you're going to start a fire in your fireplace because otherwise all that smoke and everything comes right into your house. That by itself doesn't start a fire, but imagine if you want a house full of smoke. So make sure your flue is open. Make sure that you've maintained that fireplace because your fireplace does need to be cleaned from time to time. And that's something that you can get build up in the fireplace. Oh my gosh, that is the worst way to start a fire. And you're not even thinking about it because you've got a fire in the fireplace already. It makes sense. So every once in a while, go, you're not gonna have it professionally cleaned. Get one of those logs. I don't wanna use any name brands, but there are logs out there that say for cleaning. They have creosote removers in them. You wanna use that to clean your fireplace. Another thing with your fireplace, make sure that you put a screen around it. So the screen is to prevent any embers. You know, every once in a while you get those little pops in your fires. You don't want any of those embers to escape and get out into the room. Hit a rug. There you've just started all over again. All right. These are simple things to remember anytime in the cold months, of course, but something to always keep in mind. A couple of other things to remember. Um, as far as your fire, you want to make sure that you're using seasoned wood. Uh, you don't want to use something that, you know, you just cut down last week. Not going to work. All right. A couple of other things. Let's see. What else can I think about as far as fire safety? Ah, all right. In those seasons where you're using these different lights and decorations and things like that, do you know where your fire extinguisher is? Everyone should have not one, not two, ideally three fire extinguishers in every home. So I bet most people are like, well, I have one in the garage. All right, that's all well and good. Fires can happen easily in garages. But if something happens in your kitchen, you got to run all the way out to your garage to get that fire extinguisher. I keep one in the kitchen right underneath the sink. You want to have a fire extinguisher that is a multi-purpose fire extinguisher. And it should read on it A, B, and C because it takes care of grease fires. It takes care of wood fires. That is important. You want something close at hand that everyone in the family knows where it is. So you can reach out, whether it's something on the stove or something in the fireplace, your tree, instant access. You can start taking care of the problem yourself. Other things to think about. Well, let's see, we talked about the candles, we talked about the tree, we talked about the lights. What about your smoke detectors? Have you checked your smoke detector recently? Many people do when they go into daylight savings time or the first of the year. Ideally, you shouldn't have to check your smoke detector that often if you buy the right smoke detector. There are 10 year batteries on smoke detectors. So you don't have to change your battery every year. Once again, they do cost a little bit more. I think they're about $20 more than your regular smoke detectors. But for those of us who sometimes forget, you will have a smoke detector that you can rely on for 10 years. So that makes it a lot easier. Now, what happens if you actually have a fire? You get burned. What do you do? What's, what's the first thing you do when you get burned? Most people run for, the run for the sink. They want to run it under cold water. That is fine. That's not going to cause any harm there. All right. But when do you need to seek emergency care? We used to call burns first, second, and third degree burns. We've kind of changed that terminology now, but I'm going to stick with it for now just because it's a lot easier to remember. So that first degree burn, that's what happens basically if you've been in the sun too long and you have a sunburn. It hurts, it's irritating for something to touch your skin. But other than that, not a big deal. That does not require you to come to the emergency department. That's something you can take care of easily at home. Something as simple as aloe vera gel works wonderfully as long as you don't have allergies to aloe vera. There's some other things you can do though. 
if you have a burn that's deeper. So if you have a burn that's starting to cause blisters, now I'm not talking about, you know, something minuscule, but if you have a burn that starts to blister, that's something a little bit more serious because now you've dam caused some actual damage to the skin. And that's when you wanna come and see us, or you can go to an acute care center, something to that effect that they can help you. Burns can be incredibly painful. So even if you think, well, maybe I need to go, maybe I don't. If you're having a lot of continued pain, you should come in and see one of us. Third degree burns are those deep burns. Those are those burns that go way down low. And they are the ones that require a little bit more than just burn cream and things like that. They are gonna require some serious care. I don't have any doubt that anyone who experiences one of these, they will not even think twice to come to see us. All right, that's a whole different ball game. Now you can also have chemical burns. Chemical burns are one of those things that there are many chemicals that we use even in the household, which can cause those first degree burns. Most of those household chemicals are not gonna require emergency treatment if they're just on the skin. Thorough cleansing, soap, water, you wanna get that agent off of you as soon as possible, but there's an exception to that, and that's your eyes. Any chemicals that get in your eyes, think about it, we only have one set of eyes. Some of us wear glasses, but we only truly have one set of eyes and my ladies have beautiful glasses. But your eyes, you don't wanna take any chance. If you feel like you have something in your eye that was caused by a chemical, you can start by flushing it out at home, but you need to seek medical attention if you're having any difficulty whatsoever. So I kind of digressed a little bit from my fire safety, but I've got to throw in the eyes. The eyes are just so important. They really are. So I see that Dr. Lindy asked um, about batteries. And so, yes, for your fire extinguishers, you always want to make sure that if you don't have a 10-year battery, you want to make sure that you do check those batteries at least twice a year. So not just, so if you go from the change from daylight savings time back and forth, think about that as a time to check that smoke detector, those smoke detector batteries. Wow, so much information. Great. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you're going to bring up the eyes because uh, later on um, in the month or maybe even next month, we're going to talk about eye emergencies with one of my fellow ophthalmologists, which is great, Dr. Charlotte. Great. All, All right. right. Now we're moving on to Dr. Lindy, who's going to talk to us about that, that smellless, smokeless danger that we should always be aware of carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you again, Dr. Yvette, for this platform. So I'm just going to give you the quick down and dirty um, about carbon monoxide poisoning uh, and toxicity. Um, again, I am Dr. Lindy and I am out here in these COVID streets and I have um, the honor of taking care of some amazing patients who are really, you know, fighting through and trying to um, come out on the other side of this disease. So um, I'm on my shift and I am going to go quick, okay? So um, carbon monoxide, this is a perfect segue um, from what Dr. Leslie was talking about because it really just goes hand in hand uh, in terms of carbon monoxide poisoning and, and fires. Um, that's probably, carbon monoxide poisoning is probably the most um, common way that uh, folks who do succumb or do um, have a bad outcome from a fire, it's most likely secondary to carbon monoxide poisoning as opposed to actually being burned. Um, and so, or all the complications that come from being burned. So one of my biggest concerns this holiday season um, as we face um, such you know, economic hardship and adversity and um, joblessness and um, Basically, people and families are having to ration off their resources. So the 
concern that I have and just talk with my colleagues and I'm sure you all as well is how are folks going to ration off their utilities? So the biggest way and the biggest thing that we find in terms of uh, increasing the risk for carbon monoxide poisoning in the home is um, different types of heaters. So when folks are unable to keep the heat on, unable to pay the heat bill, then they use you know, generators and other types of fuel burning um, apparatuses and devices and things like that in the home. And that is our biggest concern when it comes to this season, um, to the cold season, when it gets cold outside, we have uh, folks that use the fuel burning heaters in the home and then they increase their risk for carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, I think one of my uh, most memorable and like my colleagues, I'm sure you all probably have some of those cases that you will never ever forget. Um, I had a case fresh out of um, fellowship. I was a single coverage physician at a small rural emergency department. And I will never forget, it was a family of about, it was eight, um, the mother, father, and all the children um, came into the emergency department um, from carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, we had to intubate all of them. There was not, meaning put a breathing tube in, and there were, there were no survivors. There were actually other family members found in the home and it was a generator, uh, a fuel burning uh, generator that they used to heat the home in an enclosed space. And so um, I had not ever seen that, you know, before. And it, it just really, you know, let me know how, um, how uh, especially in, term, in times like this, when people are again, having adversity and they, have no other way to heat their home, no other way to stay warm, uh, no other way that they are aware of. They're not aware of the other options and the alternatives and ways that they can um, stay safe and stay warm without um, these fuel burning devices in their house. So, um, so, so quickly, so one of the biggest ways, um, again, so Dr. Valerie said, carbon monoxide is colorless, odorless, um, can't see it, can't taste it, can't smell it, you just are exposed to it and you go out. Um, and so it's one of the reasons why we are so, so, um, you know, we get really nervous about um, a potential home that may have leaking, a leaking um, gas furnace or um, oven or stove, gas range top, anything like that. All the things that, that sometimes we, you know, forget in the, in the winter time, we get a little bit lackadaisical, you kind of, you turn the car on because it's so cold outside, at least in Chicago, not in, in Texas and in other nice warm places, but in, and not here in California, but um, we turn our car on, warm it up. Um, we, we got the thing where you don't keep the car, the garage closed sometimes, but what, what, what we I've seen folks do is you lift the garage up, but you don't pull the car out. So um, you still have to, um, in the winter time, you're gonna warm that car up, lift the garage up, pull the car all the way out, turn it on, let it get warm. That's one of the ways that we, you know, have seen uh, carbon monoxide uh, poisoning and uh, toxicity in folks that are, um, have unfortunately uh, had uh, poor outcome secondary carbon monoxide poisoning. And again, we're talking about intentional, uh, um, excuse me, unintentional or accidents. So these are accidental things that happen. People think that they're being safe, um, when in actuality, um, we find a lot of concerns as it pertains to uh, carbon monoxide uh, exposure and poisoning. Uh, the other way, again, like we talked about with um, gas ranges and heating devices and the, the cars, even sitting inside the car while the car is getting warm, if you are in a place where there's lots of snow, um, you have to be really careful that the exhaust in the car is not covered by snow. Um, there was a case uh, a few winters ago. There were, um, I believe it was either two or three family members who were in a, they were in a car in, I believe it was a Boston area. And they uh, were sitting in the car thinking they were just getting, you know, warmed up in the car. And actually the car, the back of the car and the exhaust was submerged in, you know, a couple feet of snow. And they um, did not have a good outcome. It was, it was so tragic. Um, so some things to just really be cautious of in terms of this winter time, um, your heating sources, 
um, your vehicle. And like Dr. Uh, Leslie talked about already, um, anything that might put your increased risk for a fire in the home, you wanna be careful for all, of all of those things. So the most common um, thing that we see in the emergency department in terms of carbon monoxide poisoning is like headache, like dizziness, maybe a little bit of nausea. Um, so the symptoms are really vague. And if it's in the winter time and you or everybody in your house are all having kind of these strange, vague flu-like symptoms, you want to um, make uh, someone aware. So the uh, poison control number is, we should all know it, 1-800-222, isn't it? One, two, 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 I think that's it. <laughs> so you wanna make sure that you are, um, everybody has the poison control number at the, in the home, on the refrigerator, on the stove, um, so that you can make a call and um, your nearest poison control team can give you direction in terms of what you might need to, to do next. Um, but um, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, again, very um, preventable, um, but something that we do see very commonly um, in our emergency departments. Uh, I think over the last, um, there were some studies over the last oh, about 10 years or so, um, carbon monoxide poisoning uh, numbers are, are increasing. And also the numbers are increasing in communities of color or communities where there are poor or um, folks of um, beneath the poverty line. So that lets me know that it, again, it also has uh, some social economic um, relationship in terms of how um, the resources that families have, how they're heating their homes and things of that nature. So um, that is kind of the, the, the quick down and dirty uh, about carbon monoxide poisoning. So again, if you or anyone in your family, you all are all having the same symptoms, you know, headache, kind of malaise, just don't, don't feel good. Um, or even you smell something, you know, that doesn't smell right in the house, you know, um, you, you hear kind of a whistling. Sometimes, you know, those old range, a lot of people have the electric top stove now, but you hear something kind of whistling out of the stove, but there's no, the fire, the pilot light is actually not lit on the stove. All those things, just be really cautious and careful about, uh, about all of those things, because you really, sometimes you really won't have an obvious warning, um, but you just have to be alert, just be very, very careful, be uh, very cautious, be really aware. And the other thing Dr. Leslie talked about as well was in terms of your carbon monoxide detectors, um, and your fire detectors. Um, so kind of some of the literature I read said, you know, two or three times a year getting them checked. Um, I try to, it, it, it just kind of depends. I try to just every winter, you know, get someone in to just check, you know, they check the furnace. When they check the furnace, they check the air conditioner, kind of check all of it. You know, the same folks check the same thing. Um, so just to make sure that, you know, you don't miss anything over the winter time. Um, but we do not want to see anyone in our emergency department with carbon monoxide poisoning, carbon monoxide toxicity. So be careful, be careful, be careful, and be aware, family. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lindy. Thank you. So glad you could join us. She's joining us for a shift to give us this wonderful information. Like she said, um, I'm, th the two of them tied in wonderfully too. So I know with carbon monoxide, she said it, make sure you have a carbon monoxide monitor. Nowadays, they actually, the fire, um, fire detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, if you have an alarm system, they actually can be connected together and that lets you off. I had some family members last year that in the middle of the night, their carbon monoxide detector went off. And so most of the time you would be sleeping, you wouldn't even know it. And they were alerted by their monitor and they called the fire department and they came in and checked everything and found out where the leak is. So it's particularly with gas, um, gas um, appliances, or like she said, generators. Uh, but please, please be careful. Now there was a question in between um, and I don't know who want to take it. Maybe Dr. Leslie was, especially when you talked about the flute and um, the, the smoke um, that what happens if you get like some smoke inhalation? All right, so with smoke inhalation, there are degrees of smoke inhalation. If it's something simple like um, coming out of your fireplace, something like that where it's a contained area, if you are, if you remain in that contained area, you can definitely cause injury to your lungs. Most of the time when we talk about 
the major hazards where we worry about smoke causing damage quickly is when you're closer to a heat source. So it's not just the smoke by itself, but when people are in house fires and they eventually succumb is when the heat in combining with the smoke causes inflammation in their lungs and causes their airways to constrict and that can be fatal. In an average house, if you see something in your fireplace that you can easily contain, usually it's not gonna be a problem. If there is a house fire, you know this is beyond your help. Don't even try to run back and forth to your sink. Get out of the house, call 911. Smoke by itself, if you don't wake up because your smoke detector is not working, can be fatal. Okay, wonderful, great. Thank you for that information. All right, so moving on. Yes. So now we're going to talk to Dr. Jerisa. She's going to tell us about the holiday blues. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Yvette and the other ER doctors that, um, that have been presenting. I can also add uh, really quickly that the carbon monoxide actually this year, earlier this year, became personal for my family. Um, and so it can happen to anyone, right? And so just be mindful because sometimes you get busy um, as I did with starting a car that I really sometimes, you know, drive and forgetting about it. And so, you know, you definitely want to be mindful because carbon monoxide can be um, a silent killer. We see it in my case, we had that, you know, the carbon monoxide detectors were working, thank God. Um, and so the, we were able to call the firemen and we got that, that settled. It took some hours, but we got that settled, but it is definitely real. Um, so that's kind of personal to me. Also personal to me as an ER physician is uh, anxiety and depression and getting through tragedy. Um, we see that a lot in the emergency room. And, you know, sometimes it can manifest itself um, in different symptoms. So it doesn't have to be, okay, I'm going to the emergency room, I have anxiety. It can be, I'm going to the emergency room because I have chest pain, or I'm going to the emergency room because I have uh, palpitations or um, heartburn or reflux. And so a lot of times we see the symptoms manifest itself in the emergency department, not as a complaint of anxiety or stress. Um, but we have been trained to treat the underlying condition. So I wanted to kind of share with um, those that are watching uh, to be mindful of some of the conditions, as I mentioned, those three common, in my opinion, the three common um, complaints that we see that can be manifest or have an underlying condition of stress and anxiety. Um, chest pain is number one. We see that a lot. And you know, for those patients that come to the emergency room, definitely come if you have chest pain, you have risk factors, come. But keep in mind that it could be you are having excess stress, you are battling a lot, and oftentimes, so many times, you know, I do discharge people who have low risk factors and they have chest pain. And after even telling them, you know, sometimes I have time to get into a deeper conversation with them about what's going on, you know, what's going on in your life right now. You know, could this be manifesting itself as a physiologic uh, symptom and you have something else going on, right? And so just be mindful of that. I actually had a case this week where a, I'll mix up the age a little bit, but I had a 17 year old that came in with um, excruciating, excruciation, epigastric abdominal pain. That's pain here higher up in the, in the abdomen. Okay. No prior history of it again, 17 years old and extensive workup done, right? CAT scan, abdominal ultrasound, labs. Um, and then after all that's done, you have a deeper conversation with her parent, her father. And he says, oh my gosh, she's under so much stress. So, so much stress. And so, you know, sometimes uh, the pest may not handle that right? Um, we have to be mindful again of the underlying condition. And is the underlying condition in your case that's causing this heartburn, stress, and anxiety, okay? And sometimes some people may not want to admit that, but that is the common cause. Other things that we see are palpitations. 
again, this week I had a patient come in who had been to the cardiologist. She has had a series of, of workup done, as she should, um, but they could never find it. They could never find what was happening, which was PVCs in her case, or premature ventricular contractions. Um, she had an event monitor, she had halter monitor, she had echo, she had everything. And she even told me, she said, people think I'm crazy. People think I'm crazy because they cannot find um, the palpitations or the irregular heartbeat when I go see them. So she came, of course, to see us in the emergency room, palpitations, PVCs, evident on the monitor. She was so, so happy that I was able to catch it. But again, also in talking to her, she is under excess stress. Her labs were normal. Sometimes, you know, potassium thing, electrolytes can be a cause. So definitely seek workup. But you want to be mindful, again, is there an underlying cause that could be causing this physiologic demonstration of, uh, of this complaint? So those are three common complaints that we see quite often, where I often also will tell patients, you know, what's going on? You know, are you having excess stress? Are you having excess anxiety um, or even depression? Because it's 2020, right? It's 2020. And a lot of people have been dealing with a lot, battling, battling a lot. Um, personal to me, um, and hopefully Dr. Yvette doesn't mind me sharing, uh, earlier this year, I had a miscarriage. I had a miscarriage and I've had miscarriages before, but this particular miscarriage, um, this particular miscarriage, um, it didn't sit right with me. I'll say that, you know, I, I, I definitely had a harder time dealing with it. And because of that, uh, I was able to, um, to write a best-selling book. I wrote a best-selling book about dealing, coping with tragedy, coping with, you know, bad news, things that you didn't expect, things that we see in the emergency room often all the time. You know, we see substance abuse. We see those that are, you know, the suicide attempts. We see the anxiety and depression complaints. Um, we see the acute psychosis. You know, we see so much. But for me, um, I had a bit of anxiety as it relates to, to that tragedy. You know, the tragedy of death, which is what we're seeing a lot of um, in, in, in 2020, you know, in America. I have, you know, patients that have come in and usually their anxiety is controlled and they don't want to even go get their medication because they're scared of COVID or they don't even want to go, you know, anywhere. They don't even want to be admitted to the hospital because they're scared of COVID. It's so much that we're having to address not just the physical complaint, but also the emotional, um, the emotional issues and the complaints that's going along with the physical complaints. And so just to kind of share with um, those in terms of how I was able to get through my um, tragedy earlier this year, because this is personal to me. I'm an ER physician, but I don't mind sharing um, how I was able to get through, you know, some anxiety or some devastating moments that you may have that you experience. And so uh, for me, when you have anxiety, there are certain steps that you want to take. You should be open to being proactive, okay? And what I mean by that is being intentional, you know, something that you used to do. You know, maybe you used to go outside or maybe you used to listen to music or maybe you used to, you know, go dancing. Some things that you used to do. Bring that back, okay? Um, what I will say in terms of the, the medical side of it, medications are available. Um, we do have patients that come in and I do oftentimes, uh, depending on their, their risk factors, their personal history, I can prescribe a short term of um, anxiolytics, you know, whether that be you know, Xanax or Valium or um, Ativan, depending on the patient, I can and I will prescribe a short term of that. But when it comes to things like anxiety, depression, you really want to see how often is it happening? You know, is this an isolated event? Um, is this just every now and then? Or is, are, you, are you finding that it's more common? You know, that you're experiencing anxiety, palpitation, shortness of breath, sweatiness, tingling, you know, throughout your body. Um, those, are, 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 are side, those are the physical complaints that you can have. And it can be anxiety. Um, how often are you having that? If you're having it a lot, then you may be a candidate to be on a daily medication. We often don't prescribe daily medications in the emergency room um, where you, that, that you would take all the time. I don't, but I can oftentimes, I will give a short-term uh, dose of a medication that um, may help you um, in the immediate aspect of it. 
I feel as though for me, hopefully it's okay because again, this is personal. Um, I have a higher power that I call upon. Um, I pray. I oftentimes will pray with my patients, you know, depending on the patient and depending on the react on their um, our rapport. I will pray with my patients sometimes. Um, it's been that kind of year, especially with COVID and, you know, people not being able to have visitors. You know, we have been their visitor. You know, they can't have people come in with them. And so that's been something that I've been, uh, I've done more of this year, which is pray with um, my patients. And so because I rely on that higher power, um, I have not had to lean on medications. I have, you know, been praying more. Um, and I think that for many people that experience anxiety and reaction and anxiety or depression, uh, whether it's short term or long term, definitely look at ways to release. Okay. Um, I'm happy that over the last couple of years, there's been an increase in um, acceptance for mental health, right? Um, and so there are more people that are open to things like therapy. Okay. If you come to the emergency room, we can oftentimes get you set up or point you in the right direction. But even if you're at home, even if you say, because there's some people that don't want to come to the hospital right now, you know, you're watching this, you know, someone that's experiencing um, a, a, a tragedy going through something, um, definitely consider therapy, you know, talking to someone is okay, right? And a lot of times we have to get over the, the, the stigma, we have to get over the, you know, the myths, we have to get over the, the, the negative opinions that have historically gone along with therapy and see it as the means to a resolution, see it as a means to improvement and really consider that it is okay. And so I believe that that's one of the things that got me through, which is, which is prayer, but also considering um, medication as I spoke about um, and being open to going to the emergency room. Some people, what I've noticed is that some people think that, okay, it's just anxiety. I don't need to go to the emergency room, right? But definitely be open. It is okay. It is okay to go to the emergency room for anything, including anxiety, because oftentimes, like I mentioned, we can um, maybe give you a short-term uh, prescription or we can point you in the right direction, all right? So don't suffer at home alone. Don't suffer in silence, especially this time of year. A lot of people... Are, are battling, feeling alone, feeling hopeless, um, missing their loved one, you know? Um, and so just be mindful that there, um, there is help in the emergency room. Don't be ashamed, okay, um, to seek help. If you don't know where to go, um, definitely remember that, um, that we are available. So I'll, um, I'll probably end there because I know with time and Dr. Uh, Yvette has to present, I could go on and on um, with even more specifics for me, but keeping time in mind. I'll end I appreciate there. it. Thank you. Thank you for you sharing. And yes, you can share because the problem is, you know, we don't, people don't talk enough about that, <clears throat> especially with next carriages. And that's the other thing. You got to talk about it so that people know that they are not alone and to know resources they can find and go to. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. So I'm just going to wrap it up real quick. And oh, <clears throat> sorry. Take your time. Yeah, I'm just going to wrap it up real quick and talk about <clears throat> some other holiday things that um, you need to look for. One is falls. So <laughs> you know, people out there, they're doing their decorations, they're hanging a tree, they're doing a tree, all those things. Type of falls you should look for. If you have a ladder and you're hanging your decorations inside, outside, please, 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 if you're on a ladder, first of all, uh, if you are elderly, and I'm saying a senior citizen over 60, and you're on blood thinners, don't get on a ladder. I'm just saying that. Don't get on it. <laughs> so if you're on a ladder, you should always have somebody with you. You should never get on a ladder by yourself or alone. You should have someone there as a spotter for you. When you get on a ladder, make sure you have on good shoe wear, shoes that have good grip on them. Do not get on ladders with flip-flops or, or slip-out slippers. 
those that you get caught, you trip, you go down off the ladder. Uh, if someone should fall from the ladder, depending on how far they fall, if you're on the first and second step and they fall, that's usually what we call a fall from height. If they're all the way at the top of a 10 foot ladder and they fall down, don't move them, okay? Please don't move them. Um, call 911. They usually need to be in the position they are. And we worry about head and neck injuries, especially if they, they fell back, particularly on concrete and fell, they can jar their neck. So that's one thing about falling. Falls and slips. And if you're in an area that has ice, and it's not just in the north, it's in the south, because sometimes we have ice storms here, rain, the temperature falls at 30, have ice storms. Be careful about walking once again good shoe wear you going outside in the snow and ice wear good shoe wear where there's uh you have good grip to it and i know a lot of times we want to fall we want to do this you know and that's how we get these wrist injuries i see them broken arms broken wrists um try to tuck and roll <laughs> we know the tuck and roll method uh you want if you find yourself falling you can't stop just tuck yourself so that the full force goes over this full body and that just on one body part. All right. So <clears throat> other things, toys, toys, you're going to be thinking about Christmas toys for, for, for children. Some things you need to be aware of those, those magnets, you know, those magnet toys, those magnet beads, please. Okay. First of all, I don't know why they sell them, but that's me. No one come after me. Uh, but the magnet beads, uh, toddlers, small children like to, for some reason, put little things in their mouth. Hmm, what about that? And if they put two or three of them in, they, and they don't go together, they, they're in their, their intestines. And you can Google many pictures, and what they do is they attach, and they can attach it to each other at different parts in the intestines, and either cause an obstruction or actually a tear in the intestines which basically they're spilling their guts in their guts. That's a bad thing. You don't want that. Another bad thing is the button batteries. You know, those little li uh, lithium ion batteries that you see in uh, some toys and some remotes. There was just a recent incident where a child was, and it wasn't out of toddler, a child was trying to open something and they opened it with their mouth and the battery went down their throat. You don't want that. Button batteries is very, very dangerous. Within two hours, they will burn a hole in their esophagus. So the esophagus, you know, you have your mouth, it goes down. The esophagus goes down the chest into the, stom into the stomach. If you burn a hole in there, that's they, they need to go to the emergency room immediately if they swallow any battery, <clears throat> but definitely a button battery because you have two hours to get that out. You know, we always worry about children swallowing coins. Usually with coins, we don't worry too much because if it's a nickel or a dime, it's going to pass, especially if it goes mm. to the stomach. It's going to pass to the stomach and pass out. Quarters sometimes do get snuck of smaller children. Um, but you definitely know if, they, if it goes down and they're having trouble breathing it <coughs> and they can't do that, we worry about it being in the windpipe or in the trachea. Those have to come out. Okay, because we worry definitely about that. So, and let me just wrap up. Emergencies, we all here talking about emergencies. So make sure you all have a first aid kit at home. So we talked about burns and she talked about things you should have. You should have those. And please, if you have a burn, because cooking injuries happen during Christmas or Hanukkah, whatever holiday you're, you're experiencing. You know, we want to cook and we, we burn ourselves on the stove or you want to burn yourself, take some out the oven. Once again, you want to keep the children away from the stove. They say the two foot, foot rule. And that's another reason to have that grill around the fireplace that guard so that the, the toddlers don't get near it. So if you burn yourself, like she said, cold water sometimes help. Um, you want to have a burn cream or burn gel you can put on it. Do not, do not. Put butter on a burn. Please don't put butter on a burn. So that's what so when I say every home should have a good first aid kit. And you should have a good first aid kit for the home, one for the car, particularly if you're traveling in the car with the kids a lot. 
Um, but so burn, burn cream should be in there. I will throw out a little advertisement for a colleague friend of mine. Uh, she is a burn surgeon. She has made an awesome burn butter. So the, you can go to Dr. Shorty's, that's D-R-S-H-O-R-T-E-E-S.com, drshorties.com. And she has a great burn butter. I use it for moisturizing, but I keep some around the house because I'm always burning myself taking something out the stove. Okay. So in cuts, if you're doing cuts, um, you know, as far as cutting, a uh, cutting for Christmas dinner, Hanukkah dinner, you know, you make sure you're cutting. I've cut the fingertips off before. Make sure you have good, good knives where you, and you have, you're tucking your fingers in when you're chopping things. If you get a cut, you have to be able to wash it out, have some wound cleanser, um, have some antibiotic ointment, have band-aids re ready. This should all be your first aid kit. Um, and of course, uh, if you, if it's cut, enough where you see you're looking down to the tissue underneath and it pulls it apart and it doesn't stop bleeding you should come to the emergency room so we because we may need to sew it up sometimes we use the band the the butterfly ones the sticky but sometimes we need to sew it up particularly if it's in parts and joints where you always move it and it's going to keep it open and I'm just going to put it out there because I know all my fellow colleagues have said please don't come wrapped in a dirty grease towel because we have to wash it out a little bit more. We worry about um, um, basically it being affected. So try to, if you get a cut, try to grab a clean towel, something clean and wrap it around it and come on in and get, just put some pressure on it. So everyone have a first aid kit. Make sure you have your band-aids, your, your gauze, um, some ACE wraps for those twisted ankles when you fall. Make sure you have um, some um, allergic medicine in your first aid kit. And, you know, because people have allergies, you know, there's different allergies out there. It may be an allergy to some, a cookie someone gave you, or allergy actually to, to the Christmas tree. A lot of people get these live Christmas trees and end up having allergies and they don't even know, realize they have it. So, and of course, you know, fever reducing. And on now we're going to come in and you know what's there, you know what's going on, what's going on around us. Things have changed. So I always talk about travel medicine. So I'm going to tell you right now, traveling right now is not recommended unless you need to do it, unless you need to travel. I mean, is it an emergency that you travel? Is it for work that you're traveling? If you need to travel, if you need to travel, not for fun, <laughs> I'm just saying it because we're trying to keep those numbers down. But if you need to travel, make sure you wear your mask, protect it. So, you know, me, I actually wear two masks. I, of course, as a medical person, I have N95, but it's not available to the public. So you can double mask and have a face shield. We just say cover your eyes, really. So if you wear glasses, some people that's appropriate. Uh, you don't necessarily have to wear gloves because if you wear gloves, you have a false sense of security and you end up touching your face. Anyway, so when you touch in something else, try not to touch your face, your mouth, your lips, your eyes, because that's how germs are passed. And this is anytime. This is why I tell people during the flu season, not just the pandemic. I tell them do a flu, flu season. Don't touch your face while you're touching public things. Use hand sanitizer. So I carry with me at all times, of course, now the mask, hand sanitizer, and wipes. So if I'm on a plane or a rental car or whatever, I'm the high touch areas, seat, seat rests, window shades, monitors, in the car, key fob, gear shift, window wipers. Those are the steer wheel. Those are the things you need to wipe down. So that's my spiel for the pandemic and traveling. Uh, of course, I have a, uh, a hygiene traveling kit if you want to go to my, my store, which is drtravelqueen.com. And I know my other people have a couple freebies uh, and they have they all going to give you a tip about COVID and where you can find them. Leslie, Dr. Leslie. Yes. So as Dr. Yvette just said, and I am here in Texas, so COVID is running rampant here, just like everywhere else. Hand washing. Make sure you're washing your hands. As Dr. Yvette said about gloves, wash your hands. Keep your social distancing. And traveling 
is not necessary to go visit relatives. It is not necessary to get together during the holidays. We're here and we have things like Zoom and other platforms that you can visit virtually. Stay with that. And don't you have a freebie for them? Oh, absolutely, I do. So my freebie is I have fire safety tips and holiday safety tips. And it is a PDF that you can download. And the address for that is bit.ly forward slash holiday safety 20. So once again, that's bit-ly forward slash holiday safety 20. So feel free to pick those up and share it with your friends. Print it out, it's a PDF. Share it around as many people as you'd like because I would love not to see you all in the emergency department. Great, okay. Dr. Lindy, what you got? Where, what, what COVID uh, advice you have for them and where can they find you? You're on mute. I think she's at work too and her wife- All right, sorry about that. So my COVID advice, uh, I would say is, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. So I would say I'm um, just adding on everything that, that um, uh, all of everyone has already said. All of the things that you are going to need to find through after that stay in place, whether you have to travel for work, put it all in one um, container, one bag. So you basically have your, you may not want to call it your COVID bag. You may want to call it your infectious disease protection bag, or I don't know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Because what happens is that you get out and you're like, oh, I forgot my mask. or oh, I forgot my hand sanitizer. or oh, I forgot this. Put everything in one place. I think that's one of the things that's most helpful for me is to have it all centralized. And um, uh, I think the other thing is, um, oh, just try to think of innovative and creative ways to spend time with loved ones and family until, until we get through uh, through this, okay? And for uh, for freebies, um, I will have, it's not quite ready yet, but I will have at uh, www.theluxdocs.com, that's www.t-h-e-l-u-x-d-o-c-s.com. Um, I have, um, in, during this time, it's, it's been really crazy, but We've been able to develop some things that I think are helping um, our physicians feel better, helping the patients that we take care of feel better when they see us um, with some beautiful fabrics, beautiful colors, uh, something that's bright. Because just like Dr. Teresa talked about, you know, there is a lot of anxiety and stress and depression, and we are trying to find joy in everything that we that we do. We're here at the hospital a lot, and it helps us when we we look good, and then we have something beautiful that feels good and is a beautiful color against our skin. We like it, our patients like it. Um, and so that's kind of what I, you know, am having uh, and making available to, uh, to my colleagues and, and friends. And also to uh, those of uh, our family and friends and those who love us and wanna help support us, um, you can feel free to go onto that site as well and purchase gift cards and um, uh, gift accessories and be able to just kind of contribute to a frontline worker. If you want to support them, they can use that gift card and come to our site and be able to uh, purchase either a, a luxury uh, lab coat or um, scrub cap or a customized mask. And they are all coordinated. Thank you. Back to Teresa. Thank you so much. All right. So um, as it relates to COVID, just yesterday um my um two i have two babysitters so my one babysitter she decided that although she's she's nervous she's scared about covid because some people aren't um she usually always wears a mask she went running and she didn't have her mask on her so definitely always have a mask on your person um but she didn't have her mask on her because she's like okay i'm outside i'm not gonna run into anybody so she ended up seeing uh, an old friend and her and their two and her friend's two kids she didn't have on a mask they didn't have on masks so she said I leaned down to talk to the kids and to tell the kids to wear masks but she didn't have on a mask so the the day before the night before so this is Thursday night now yeah Thursday night they called her and told her that they were COVID positive I'm like Lord are you serious so, um, you know, just always wear a mask because 
you don't know who has it. You don't know who has it. By the time they could have a positive COVID test, you've already made right. to them. That's you've already right. laying down in their face thinking they're all good and they right. breathing COVID on you. So, you know, just always wear a mask, always have a mask on you and always assume that anybody could have it. Anybody could have it, yep. right? Um, in terms of a freebie, I don't really have a freebie right now. Anyone that's watching can, um, you know, you can follow me on social media at Dr. Jerisa Berry on Instagram, um, not really on Twitter that much, and also on Facebook. Um, things that I've gone through this year, um, I've been able to, um, to still be successful and to still endure. And um, despite how the year started, um, I definitely have um, increased and I'm thankful for that. Uh, I have developed, along with some other uh, colleagues, um, the wellness boxes. So if anyone is interested um, in any kind of gifts for, you know, females, if you have a, you know, a girl in your life, a female in your life, definitely you can check out the wellnessboxes.com. I have something there for um, immunity. I have something there for hair and beauty and even hair loss. So um, that's what I have to offer. Um, and you can always follow me, like I said, on social media. Okay, great. We got all those links down and I hope everybody got it. And I'm glad everybody that enjoyed it. If you have questions and you was listening, um, you can email us and throw it in the links or on Facebook. I know some people was watching us from Facebook. So once again, I am Yvette McQueen, MD. Uh, I can be reached at www.yvettemcqueenmd.com and on all social media at Yvette McQueen MD. So thank you, emergency people. Thank you for caring. Thank you for sharing. And we're out. <laughs> Bye. Bye.